para todos, todo para nosotros. So, soñamos en grande que se caiga el imperio. Lo gritamos algo, no queda más remedio. Esto no es utopía, es alegre rebeldía del baile de los que sobran de la danza de mi mía. Levantarnos para decir ya va. Ni África ni América Latina se suba. Un barro con casco con la pizza patear el fiasco. Provocar un social terremoto en este charco.
Greetings, everyone. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you have any issues seeing or hearing me, as always, put them in the chat. Oopsies. The stream started out. Now I know the audio is working because I had the stream open in another tab and I heard myself and it was very awkward. But greetings, my name is Onya Samu. I am a member of the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party, specifically in New Mexico chapter. And this is weekly Pan-African news. We do the show every single Thursday. Hi, Monica. Usually it's at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. We thank y'all so much for joining us an hour later today at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, we had some work issues that we had to attend to. <laughs> this is honestly happening in the middle of a work day. It always does. And so, yeah, thank you for joining us an hour later. As I mentioned, my name is Onyesanu. I am a cadre member of the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party. The All African Peoples Revolutionary Party is a revolutionary pan-African socialist mass political party based in Africa, founded in Africa 52 years ago this year by Juan Kwame Nkrumah. If you don't know who Kwame Nkrumah is, he was the first democratically elected president of the first African nation to gain independence from European colonialism. That nation was Ghana. When Ghana gained its independence, at the very first Independence Day, Kwame Nkrumah gave a speech where he said, the independence of Ghana is meaningless without the total liberation of Africa and African people. And he was correct. He was correctly calling for Pan-Africanism as the means by which African people would liberate ourselves and liberate our land. And so the political objective of the African People's Revolutionary Party is Pan-Africanism which we define as one unified socialist Africa, because when all African nations are unified and free, African people everywhere will be unified and free. So this is weekly Pan-African news. We do it every single week on Thursdays, usually at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Today we're doing it at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. We might be doing it at 12 p.m. Mountain Time going forward. We started this show at the beginning of the pandemic. We used to do quite a number of in-person events here on Tiwa territory, also known as Albuquerque. And when uh, the pandemic started, we realized that we would not be able to gather our people safely um, in person. And so we were like, how do we keep talking to folks? How do we keep raising consciousness? How do we keep making Pan-Africanism a part of the narrative? And we we're like, why don't we just make our own lane? Why don't we start our own show? And so we did, it's this. Uh, I'm losing my train of thought because someone is messaging me. <laughs> what was I saying? What was I saying? What was I saying? Oh yeah, so we started the show back in March. We've been doing it for a couple of months straight. Um, every single show we go deeper into a political education topic. Um, so one thing you should know about the APIP is that we do not have any event anywhere without an aspect of political education. Like, it is the core part of what we do. If you're a member of the APIP, you are required to be part of a work study process where we like read together and learn together. Externally, we have all kinds of political education events so that we can put revolutionary African analysis into the world so you can begin to raise the consciousness of our people and also, oh my God, sorry, I'm like off my game today. Hopefully when the show gets going, I'll get it together. Anywho, so we do a political education topic every single show. Last week we talked about what is revolutionary solidarity. This week we're gonna be talking about what is actually revolution, like what is a revolution? Revolution is a word that you hear a lot it's kind of like thrown around like a brand. Um, people call all kinds of things revolutionary, like from dish soap to new soda flavors to colors called revolutionary. Um, sometimes political movements that are really about upholding the existing system, existing system are called revolutions. And so because of this, because revolution is a word that's used like mad loosey goosey, uh, there's not like a really clear understanding of what a revolution actually is. And so we're gonna talk about that today. But before we jump into that political education topic, we want to talk first. We do two things at the beginning of every show. First, we always bring in an ancestor that is um, a person who came before us, who was in this work before us, on whose shoulders we stand. Um, as African revolutionaries, we understand that we are part of a continuum of struggle that began the very first moment, the very first colonizer set foot on the shores of Africa. That was more than 600 years ago. And so we understand that the only reason that APRP New Mexico exists today, the only reason why I am able to speak to you today is because of the people that came before me. It's because of my ancestors who fought and struggled and built 
and led and learned and built the foundation that makes it possible for me to even be on this platform speaking to y'all. It's quite, it is not an exaggeration to say that there would be no African revolution, there would be no pan-Africanist movement, there would be no hope for the liberation of Africa and African people without the work of the people that came before us, without the work of our ancestors. And so we always wanna call them in to say that we owe what we are to you and that we are carrying on your legacy to liberate our people. So the ancestor I want to bring in today is a person who I'm going to talk about more in depth a little bit later, but her name was Satina Sila. She was an African woman, a very young African woman, who was a leader within the PIGC, one of the revolutionary organizations we're going to be talking about today. The PIGC organized the masses of African people in Guinea-Bissau and successfully liberated that country from Portuguese colonialism through an armed revolutionary struggle. Tatina Sila was one of the leaders of that armed revolutionary struggle. She was a mother. She was like in her early 20s. Um, and she was still a committed and full-time and militant revolutionary because one of the common misconceptions about revolution is that it's something that men do. It's a project of men with guns. But with the example of the PIDC and the example of Guinea-Bissau and the example of a couple of other cases that we're going to talk about, what we will actually see is that people like Tatina Sila, this young African woman, this mother, are actually who revolutionaries have always been. Revolution is not a project of men with guns. Revolution is a project of an entire society, an entire people organized correctively ar collectively around the objective of being free. So Tatina Sila of the PIDC, heroine of the revolution against Portuguese colonialism, is the ancestor that we are bringing in today. The other thing that we always start the show with is a land recognition. That is to say that I am speaking to you from stolen land. I am speaking to y'all from Tiwa territory, also known as the city of Albuquerque. The Tiwa Pueblo is the rightful owner of the land on which Albuquerque was built. This is their shit. It will always be their shit. It is always going to be their shit. It doesn't matter how long ago something was stolen, it stays stolen for life until the rightful owner gets it back. And so this is Tiwan Nation, uh, Tiwan Nation land. The entirety of the United States is stolen indigenous land, just like the entirety of Africa is stolen African land. And just like we are going to fight to get our land back in Africa from the Cape to Cairo, indigenous nations here will get their land back. Palestinian people will get their land back. Irish people will get their land back, land back all over the world. When we do land acknowledgements, it's not just to be like, thanks, <laughs> we're keeping it, is to be like, no, we are going to do everything in our power collectively as colonized peoples, as people who have been dispossessed, to make sure that all land stolen is returned, point blank, period. It's not a metaphor. We are serious. So that's the land acknowledgement. That is the ancestor. And now let's jump into political education. Greetings to the folks watching and in the comments. Hi, Sean. Hi, Monica. Hi, Davut. Um, three different platforms. We're currently streaming on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at the same time. It's incredible. So, like I mentioned, the political education topic for the show today is what is a revolution and how do we build one? What is a revolution actually and how do we make one of those things happen? So to open up this conversation, I want to read a quote by Fidel Castro who was one of the leaders of the Cuban Revolution and, of course, went on to become um, the president of Cuba for a very, very long time. He was voted in repeatedly because the people loved him and because they believed in his vision for Cuba. Um, and so this is a, uh, a quote from a speech he gave at a mass rally um, held by Cuban youth students and workers on International Workers' Day, also known as May Day, also known as May 1st, 2009. So I'm going to read it and then we're going to get into it. So revolution is the sense of the historical moment. It is changing everything that must be changed. It is full equality and freedom. It is being treated and treating others like human beings. It is emancipating ourselves by ourselves and with our very own efforts. It is challenging the dominant powerful forces within and outside of the social and national arena. It is defending the values one believes in at the cost of any sacrifice. It is modesty, selflessness, altruism, solidarity, and heroism. It is fighting with audacity, intelligence, and realism. It is never telling a lie or violating ethical principles. It is the profound conviction that there is no force on earth that can crush truth and ideas. Revolution is unity. It is independence. It is fighting for our dreams of justice for Cuba and the world. That is the basis of our patriotism, 
our socialism and our internationalism. So once again, that is a quote from a speech given by Fidel Castro, longtime president of the Revolutionary Socialist Nation of Cuba, given at a mass rally organized by Cuban youth students and workers on the occasion of International Workers Day, also known as May Day. And the reason why I love that quote, the reason why I wanted to share it with y'all is because he, in like a paragraph, like encapsulated the whole point of revolution. Revolution isn't just like a new radical thing. Revolution is not like a brand name. Revolution isn't like when you drink Pepsi instead of Coke or like Pepsi comes out with a clear color. Revolution is even not even Bernie Sanders saying, let's have Medicare for all. That is not what revolution is. What revolution actually is, is the total transformation from the bottom up of a given society. It is saying that the way that things are constituted now, the way that society functions now is fundamentally unjust. It is unfair to us as the people living within that society. It is unfair to the resources and the land and the life upon which that society is built. And so we, as oppressed people, we as people living within that society are going to move together, are going to organize together collectively to transform it, to say we do not accept the way things are. We think that we can do better and that we're gonna work together to build better. So obviously from jump, like when we're talking about a collective process of social transformation, when we're talking about the concept of revolution, maybe you're thinking immediately of people with guns, right? Engaging in an armed struggle. And certainly that's absolutely part of it. Certainly that's an aspect of many revolutions, maybe like all revolutions. It was definitely an aspect of the Cuban revolution, but that's not the only part. Because we have to understand that like the part with the people with the guns is not ever gonna work unless the entire society has been organized around the same objective, around the same objective of agreeing to do this together and around the same objective of what's gonna be built in its place, right? So like we have a conception of revolution that's very patriarchal, that's very individualistic, that's very capitalist, that is mostly about people spontane, like a bunch of dudes spontaneously deciding that shit's gonna pop off and then all of a sudden the revolution happens. That's not how it works. Like Fidel Castro says in this quote, let me see. Blah, 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 blah. It is full equality and freedom. It is being treated and treating others like human beings. It is emancipating ourselves by ourselves with our very own efforts. Emancipating ourselves by ourselves with our very own efforts. It is challenging the dominant powerful forces within and outside of the national arena. It is defending the values one believes in at the cost of any sacrifice. It is modesty, selflessness, altruism, solidarity, and heroism. It is fighting with audacity, intelligence, and realism. It's not just about a handful of dudes picking up a gun and being like, we're burning this shit down. It is about the entire society deciding together that we don't want to live this way anymore. We want to be free. And we're going to fight for our freedom on our own. We're going to build that freedom with our own hands together. So that is like the context that I want to start this conversation with. Like from the jump, like we are not going to be talking about some dude's guns. We're not going to be talking about spontaneous introduction. We're going to be talking about what it actually takes to build a revolution. So like I said, that is what a revolution is. It is the total transformation of a, of a society around the objective of total liberation for the people living in that society. Like very, very clearly, we live in a capitalist global system that exploits all of us, that is racist, that is white supremacist, that is anti-woman, that is anti-queer, that is anti-children, that is anti-elders, that is anti-disabled people. Like we are living within a system that we did not build that functions based on our exploitation and our dehumanization. So this is a particular condition where a lot of us agree that something has to change, but not yet does a movement exist to make that change possible. The process of building a revolution is the process of building that movement. A revolution, once again, is the collective transformation, the total transformation of a given society with the collective efforts of the people within that society. So let's get into how, oh yeah, so someone's asking all African People's Revolutionary Party, is this the same one with Kwame Ture? Yes, it is the same party of Kwame Ture. Kwame Ture was one of the founding members of the APRP. We're still out here. Hello. Um, so how do revolutions happen? So I already mentioned how they don't happen. What they, what they, how they don't happen is like a bunch of dudes like suddenly deciding we're going to overthrow the government and then just like marching and then doing it successfully. 
revolutions don't happen because people take to the streets because they're mad and like burn down a bunch of buildings and then are all of a sudden okay like the revolution's here and then they win it's not how it works revolution cannot happen spontaneously there are some people who believe that revolution can happen spontaneously but it never actually has like i believe in like the power of imagination but i have to like work with like how things are actually functioning in like reality right and so there hasn't ever been a revolution a successful revolution in the history of the world where people spontaneously decided that they were going to do that shit and won. like it hasn't happened it's just not a thing but you know some people hold that up as a possibility we're not going to be talking about that as a real thing here but how they do happen is long-term systematic organizing of an entire oppressed people around the shared objective of liberation. So long-term, so meaning like it's not like a week, it's not a month, it's not three months, it's not even a year. We're looking at a timeline of like 10 years, 20 years. Keeping Revolution took like 30, 40 years. Like we are looking at long-term organizing to build the conditions that make a revolution possible to build the conditions that make a revolution successful this is a long haul project it is not something that just happens because we decide we want to do it it's something that has to be built over the long term systematic organizing of an entire oppressed people so understanding that we as african people for example we have elders we have youth we have women we have children we have workers we have people who are systematically unemployed we have sex workers we have you know professional people in professional organizations we have all of these segments queer people disabled people trans people we have like all of these segments of african people that must be organized around this same objective of liberation you are not ever going to have a successful revolution if you're like let's go for like the dudes like just the, just like the straight dudes and we're going to lead them to revolution and then everybody else would just like fall like it's not it's not going to happen you have to organize every single segment of an oppressed people around this objective of the total transformation of society in order for it to be successful every single sector of an oppressed people must be organized into the revolution must be recruited into the revolution and then the other piece that you need alongside that shared objective alongside that systematic organizing a long time alongside that like long-term building is that you need an ideology you need a theory you need people to understand why things are the way they are what we can do collectively to change those things and what that change is going to look like that is what an ideology gives you for example the ideology of the all african people's revolutionary party is necrumism to rayism we define our political objective as one unified socialist africa and within the ideology of necrumism to rayism we lay out like a complete plan for how we're going to build a revolution in africa we are trying to unite all of the struggling African people's parties around this singular objective of one unified socialist Africa. We are building African united fronts to unite these African people's organizations around this objective. And we are also pushing hard, hard for our people to be active members of organizations. People are like trying to flirt. They're trying to flirt on the Twitch stream. I understand that I look cute today, um, but I can't, I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't help you. One second, so it's less distracting. So yeah, like I mentioned, revolution takes long-term organizing, systematic organization of an entire oppressed people around a shared objective, and then an ideology that they can use to destroy the current structure of society and build something better in its place. So situations where you might need a revolution, going from capitalism to socialism, ending this global system based on domination and exploitation, is gonna take a revolution there is no path to taking capitalism out of power that is not going to require a total transformation of society like capitalism's roots are in too deep the ruling class's roots are in too deep they manipulate everything to their benefit to make us believe that capitalism serves us and so in order to destroy that order in order to replace capitalism completely to defeat it decisively it is going to require a revolution on a global scale like the biggest revolution that the planet has ever seen Lucky for us, we have small examples to make it, make it clear it's possible. But that is a situation where the kind of change required to the system, 
to make it instead of being you know built for a few people having it be built for all of us is going to require tearing down the existing system entirely and building something better in its place so the transition from capitalism to socialism is something that's going to will require a revolution other situations that would require a revolution are moving from colonization to independence or decolonization so colonization is a structure in which a foreign dominating power goes into a targeted territory and steals their land and steals their resources and exploits the paper the people and basically reorganizes society in such a way that is completely dedicated to extracting from the colonized nation to the colonizer nation and so a relationship like that is not ever going to be ended because suddenly like the colonizer is like oh man this is messed up like they're not ever going to latch like they're they're uh, almost a leech right they're not going to like drop off by themselves even if they're full they're going to stay lashed onto us right and so in order to to interrupt that relationship in order to change the fundamental of relation uh, nature of that relationship built on extraction built on exploiting us colonized people must engage in a revolutionary struggle to destroy the colonial relationship to destroy the structure of colonization and this is actually what we see in places like africa in places like central and south america in places like asia in the 60s and 70s and 80s all those revolutionary struggles that happened in places like uh, Guinea-Bissau, that happened in places like Mozambique, that happened in places like uh, occupied, like apartheid South Africa, in Vietnam, in Iran, um, all, all throughout the, 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 the so-called global south, those were anti-colonial revolutionary struggles. That was nations of oppressed and colonized peoples organizing collectively on a mass basis to engage in a revolutionary struggle to defeat colonialism. And they won in place after place after place after place because they decided as a collective, we are done with this relationship. We are done with the structure of colonization. Y'all are not going to give us our freedom because you depend on exploiting us to prop up your, your societies. And so we are going to, by force, change this relationship. That is what a colonization is. That is what a struggle for national liberation is. It is a colonized or oppressed people moving collectively to destroy the colonial relationship and build a new one in this place. So transition from colonization to independence, national liberation is a, is a process, is a transition that would require a revolution. And just like the overlying like point of these examples is that in a society, in like a way of, of structuring a society in which one group of people is dependent on the exploitation of another group of people, there is nothing that will voluntarily get the oppressors to give up that relationship. They are not ever going to give us our freedom because they benefit from our oppression. They benefit from our oppression and there is nothing in their interest about giving it up. They're not going to do that. And so what we are saying when we say that capitalism to socialism, colonization to decolonization are, are transitions that require revolutions is to say that they are not going to give us our freedom. So we must take our freedom. We must win our freedom, and revolution is how we do that. Let me see what y'all saying in the comments. Prudence is saying, I don't know how people can think the ruling class will just magically stop sucking the life out of humanity. When has that ever happened in the history of the world? It has never happened in the history of the world. Never has a colonizer nation or a ruling class power or an imperialist power voluntarily granted people their freedom without ulterior motives. And what I say, what I mean by that is that They'll oftentimes say, oh, yeah, you can be free here. We'll grant you your freedom, right? Like, that's precisely what happened in Ghana. In Ghana, there was a mass, like a peaceful people's movement of positive action. The primary strategies they used were strikes and marches and demonstrations. And through that mass movement, they were able to, you know, get uh, vote Kwame Nkrumah into power and to say, hey, Britain, we would like our independence. And Britain was like, okay, sure. And so they granted the independence, right? And then, as soon as Kwame Nkrumah and the masses of African people in Ghana were like, we would actually like to be socialists, Britain and the United States were like, hell no. And they moved, they maneuvered to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah's government, to take him out of power, to recolonize Ghana. So what that example shows is that even though the British Empire paid lip service to the idea of Ghanaian independence, as soon, like, they maintained their hooks, right? They, made, they, like, st they, they fell back. But they were like watching and they maintained their hooks in the society. And then as soon as the society started moving in a way that they did not want, 
As soon as the society started moving in a way where the resources in Ghana would be collectively controlled by African people, the former colonizers moved decisively to destroy that independence, to take out the person that the African people had elected, to put in the government that they wanted to see in its place. So never, ever, ever trust a colonizer that's talking about, yes, you can be independent, because all they're doing is accepting the reality that people want to be free and then re like maneuvering to a new place where they can maintain control. Like, that's precisely what neocolonialism is. We should do a whole show about that. But bottom line, point blank, no colonizer, no bourgeois, no imperialist nation is ever going to willingly grant the liberation of anybody. If we want to be free as African people, as oppressed and colonized people, as women, as queer and trans people, as disabled people, that we have to fight for that shit. No oppressor is going to give you your freedom. Doesn't matter how you ask. Doesn't matter how nice you are. Doesn't matter if you like show them in detail how they're hurting you. It does not matter. The only way that we as oppressed people will be free is if we fight for that freedom through a revolutionary process. Whew. Monique is asking, well, why would colonizers give people liberation? They profit off our exploitation. It's a very good question. Sometimes people say, this is like a thing that really annoys me. This is kind of a tangent. But sometimes people will be like, um, it's the responsibility of Europeans, of white people to end racism. And every time I hear that, I'm like, why would they do that? Like, like, do we understand that racism is not just like an attitudes, right? It's like a, a whole structure that European people materially benefit from. So like, when people are like, y'all have to end this, it's your work. I'm like, that might be the case, but if that's like actually the case, then we are screwed. Because there is absolutely no way that they would voluntarily like destroy a relationship from which they benefit. Like, why would they do that? Would you do that? Like, the whole system was built to have them at the top, right? Um, and they like, as like the land was being stolen, as Africa was being colonized and exploited, like they were getting like benefits, like mo like cash money and like resources from that. So like, because, because they're supposed to be like, oh, this is wrong. And you're like yelling at them. They're just going to give that up. Like all, all of that. Like, I don't, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So when people are like, it's white people's job to solve racism. I'm like, you must not want racism to end ever. I think that the only way we're going to end racism is if colonized African people, colonized people, racialized people organize collectively to destroy colonialism so that it doesn't matter whether Europeans want to end or not, we're going to end it for you. So yeah, that's a, that's an example of like this kind of like thought process that says that if we like make our case to oppressors in a palatable way, that they'll somehow like snap out of it and like destroy the exploitative relationship. It's never happened. It's never happened. Europeans are not going to end racism. That's on us to end racism. And we end racism through a revolutionary struggle of national liberation. Um, so yeah, we got into how do revolutions happen. So how they happen is through long-term systematic organizing of an entire oppressed people around the shared objective of liberation and destroying the current structure of society to build something better in its place. How revolutions do not happen is spontaneous insurrection, like, I'm sorry, I deeply celebrate uh, people going into Walmart during times of uprising and like getting free TVs, like that shit's lit. But what it's not gonna do is lead to a revolution. I'm sorry, burning down a police station in the heat of a moment during a spontaneous protest is not going to lead to the revolution. I remember when the George Floyd stuff was popping off at the beginning of the summer, a lot of people on the left were like, is this it? Is it happening? Is it happening? And then as we saw in the months that followed, all that happened is that those protests were met by intense police violence, oftentimes deployed by Democratic mayors and governors. They were met with intense surveillance and targeted arrests. And they were also met with very systematic strategies of co-optation that turned the radical demands of the people in the streets into a com uh, reformist and assimilationist demands um, held up by like, celebrities and people in elected office. So all that happened is that all of that spontaneous energy, all of that anger that was like righteous and just, all of the radicalism and militants that we saw in the streets was redirected almost entirely into the existing um, government system, specifically into the Democratic Party. Now we see like um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris running campaign ads, talking about George Floyd can't vote, uh, Breonna Taylor can't vote, so vote for them for us. Oh my God, like it's so offensive. But that's precisely what happens with spontaneous rebellion, right? 
is that because it's not organized, because it doesn't have, you know, that long-term systematic foundation of organization, it is extremely easily co-opted by the ruling class by the colonizer class. And that happens time after time after time after time. It happened with Ferguson, it happened with Baltimore, it happened with the George Floyd uprising. It's gonna keep happening until we understand that revolution is not a spontaneous process. Revolutions must be built. Revolutions take long-term organizing of all of us, of the entire oppressed people in order to be successful. And it's just not something that's ever gonna happen in an afternoon because people are burning shit down. It's just not gonna happen. And like, like, I'm, like I said before, like, please, if there's social unrest in your area, go to Walmart and get a TV, like, please, please. But also understand, like, although there's nothing wrong with that, although all we're doing is taking, like, a fraction of what's been taken from us, um, it's still not going to lead to a revolution on its own. So revolution requires long-term systematic organizing of an entire oppressed people around the shared objective of liberation and destroying the current structure of society. You cannot do that spontaneously. It must be built on the long term. And that takes me to the next point that I want to talk about in terms of um, revolution. The question of armed struggle, the question of whether revolutions are necessarily violent. So I have a particular point of view about this that is informed by being a member of a revolutionary pan-Africanist organization. And that is to say that, especially in the age of imperialism as it's dying, especially in the age of neocolonialism, there is no possible way to have a revolution without an armed struggle component. That's not the primary component. It's not even the most important component. But it is a component that recognizes that, once again, these oppressors, these neo-colonizers, this ruling class, these racists, they're not going to give up their power voluntarily. They're going to do everything they can to manipulate, to twist, to turn, to co-opt, to destroy movements, to infiltrate, everything they can to make sure they do not lose power. And so at some point, when our forces are strong enough, at some point, when our forces are organized enough to contest for power, it is going to come to an armed struggle. It's just going, it's just a fact of the matter because they're not going to give it up. They will, they are literally in the process of destroying the planet that we're all living on because they do not want to give up a cent of their resources. They will literally destroy every drop of water, like poison every drop of water, burn every acre of land, extract everything from every mine and not stop. They'll do, they'll, they'll deplete this planet and go to space. Like they're already planning to do that. So what that shows you is that they are not willing to stop this, even if it, even, even if it also takes out them. So understanding that, then we have to understand if that's like what the, the kind of irrationality we're dealing with, that ultimately in order to take them out of power, we're going to fight. We have to go to fight on every level. And that includes on the armed struggle level. So to me, um, for a revolution to be successful, it must have this component of armed confrontation at some point. But that does not mean that it, that is all that revolution is. Because the armed struggle component is probably like, if I was doing like t percentages, it's like 10% of the overall project. Because the work that you need to organize everybody in society around this objective is again, long-term, is systematic, is it requires like more conversations and political education and like organizing food programs and hospitals and mass distribu distributions and um, means of production for a given society, much, much more than anyone picking up a gun. The gun part is important, but the gun part cannot happen without the long-term, mostly peaceful, systematic organizing that I am talking about. So like people like way overstate the necessity or like the, the overall importance of armed struggle to a revolution. Armed struggle is important. Armed struggle is a part of it, but armed struggle is like way down the line and like comes at the end of a, quite a bit of necessary work that must happen before armed struggle is even feasible, is even possible. And the other thing I wanna say about armed struggle from the other side, right, is that a lot of people are put off of the idea of revolution entirely because they are, you know, they say they're anti-violence, right? They say, I do not support oppressed people taking up, you know, arms to liberate themselves because violence is wrong. And it's a very interesting position because you, like this, there's nothing in this society that exists without an extraordinary amount of violence. Um, for example, like flowers, right? Flowers that you could buy at Smith's or like a flower shop, like a fancy flower shop are grown 
um, by people working for slave wages in plantation conditions in places like Mexico, in places like Central and South America. So like the pretty flowers you see in the store are most oftentimes not grown in the, in the town where, they're, where they were where they're, um, for sale. Instead, they're grown in like a third world country and then like brought over on a truck. And the people growing the flowers are subjected to abuse and rape and exploitation. So even something like flowers comes with an extreme amount of violence because that is how capitalism functions. If you're a vegan, for example, and you eat no meat, because meat is like, you know, which is which is valid. Like the capitalist process of producing meat for consumption is barbaric. It is monstrous. Um, so I understand what people say. I am not gonna participate in that because that is messed up. But but even if you eat nothing but fruits and vegetables, unless you are growing those fruits and vegetables yourself, even if you're getting them from Whole Foods or whatever, whatever fancy ass organic place, they are being grown by people paying, being paid slave wages you, uh, under plantation conditions, like undocumented people, indigenous people, African people, migrant workers who are desperately exploited and mistreated by the people running these farms where this food is grown. So even a vegan lifestyle, um, which is a vegan lifestyle because you're trying to avoid the cruelty to animals, still comes with a built-in amount of cruelty because of capitalism. The entire system of capitalism cannot function without massive violence. Massive violence on a global scale. There is literally nothing produced under the capitalist mode of production that does not come with some level of exploitation. And so when people are like, I am against violence to end oppression, I'm like, but you're okay with the violence required for your day-to-day -day life. You're okay with the violence required to produce your computer. You're okay with the violence required to produce your cell phone. You're okay with the violence required to produce your clothes and your food. And even to like uphold the system of government you believe in, that you're, fight, that you're saying that people should not try to take down with violence. But you're not okay with people using violence to end oppression? Like that's where you draw the line? Okay. I feel like that's like a like a worldview that can only exist under capitalism or under um, specifically like liberalism, right? Because the whole ideology of liberalism and capitalism says that it is okay for a society to be built on massive violence as long as it's not happening to like the chosen people. Like as long as the person living in the United States, like people are able to accept a massive amount of destruction and violence in their name with their tax dollars because it's not directly affecting them. And so that's the kind of like worldview that capitalism creates. And that's how people can say like, I'm anti-violence to end depression while living, like literally standing on a pile of corpses. Like their whole way of life is built using violence and that's fine. But if, people, if the people who are like, they're standing on are like, I would like to use violence to end this, it's a bridge too far. So I just wanna talk about that briefly because I feel like it's a very silly, silly way to feel. Like armed struggle is a ugh, necessary component of national liberation. A successful revolution will most likely have a component of armed struggle. And also the violence that oppressed people use to end their oppression cannot be compared to the violence of that oppression. It is asinine to do so. It is tacitly accepting the worldview of the oppressor and saying that we are not justified in using any means necessary to end that oppression. What are y'all saying? Lord Blade Jammer from Black Hammer, what's up comrade? They're so colonized so they can get the universal basic whiteness they love. Monika says, appealing to our morality, there's no such thing, they have no morality. Right? Like, that's why I'm trying to, like, swear less because I got um, criticism about my language. And I was like, okay, I should be able to, like, convey my, um, my thoughts without profanity if that's what people are asking for. So I'm trying. But the reason why, like, I, like, I, like was resistant at first is because the, the same people who say, like, saying, like, the F word is wrong or, like, the S word is wrong or like, the B word is wrong are, like, the same people that, like, created this society built on overwhelming violence. The same people who will accept a world where African people are enslaved, like African children are enslaved to produce the minerals needed to make cell phones. And that's fine. That's fine. Like Joe Biden can like be one of the main architects of an illegal war in a country that was minding its own business that led to the, the, uh, um, the murder of millions of people, including hundreds of thousands of children. And that's fine, but he's less evil. So people like have these standards of morality produced by capitalism that will look away from like all of this violence and all of this like degradation, like dehumanization, like just accept that. But then like things like seeing like a nipple, seeing like a nipple or like saying a cuss word, it's like, it's too far. All this is fine, but F word, too much, too much. Like, so I'm just like, it's ridiculous to me. But I also understand that like people uh, have different, react differently to like profanity. So I'm trying, right? But like, that's why I was resistant because I was like, what standard morality could capitalist or Western society ever have that I would feel beholden to? 
none. <laughs> I'm doing it for y'all, not because I believe in that shit. Whoops, sorry. Um, Monika says, it is exhausting to see vote for black lives and using our people who have been murdered saying vote for them. There's an extreme disconnect. We organize and work toward revolution for them, for all of our people. Yes, I agree. Every time I see one of those ads, every time I, I've seen like African people posting these memes talking about George Floyd can't vote, so vote for him, or Breonna Taylor can't vote, so vote for so vote on her behalf, and the implications that they should vote for Joe Biden. And it's like very offensive to me. Um, first of all, because Black Lives Matter started when Barack Obama was president and Biden was vice president. African people were being murdered by the police at the same frequency under a Democratic president than the Republican president before. So the idea that a vote for Joe Biden would somehow be helping them or helping to end that is like deeply offensive. I'm like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? First of all, Joe Biden wants to give police 300 million more dollars. Joe Biden has, despite a mass movement on the streets demanding it, refused to defund the police. Kamala Harris is a former prosecutor who locked up record numbers of African people, including African mothers. So you're telling me that the Black Lives Matter vote is the cop and the person that wants to give more money to the cops, the person that when he was previously in power, helped give them the military weapons that they're using to put down these protests? The person when asked about the uprisings in Philly, after that disabled African man was murdered in front of his mother, when asked his thoughts about that, said these people need to stop looting, that's the Black Lives Matter vote. Get out of my face. Like, get out of my face. I hate that shit. Anyway, so yeah, I'm like going on mad tangents, but question is, are revolutions violent? Answer is, sometimes yes, and that's fine. So next, I want to talk about how revolutions are actually won. So we talked about how they happened. We talked about like, you know, what they're trying to do. We talked about what they are. So let's talk about how they win. And as an African person, as a colonized person, I come from the political lineage that has had the most successful revolutions on earth. Like for all the backseat ass driving that people in the United States do, they have never fought a revolution successfully here. Like the American Revolution was not a revolution. The American Revolution was a counter revolution. That's another conversation. But the by far the most successful revolutionary struggles in the history of the planet have been waged by African and colonized people. We are the experts on revolution, on specifically winning revolutions. So I just want to put that out there first, um, that this history is like the history of my people. And next, how are revolutions won? I'm going to go bullet by bullet. So if the fundamental objective of a revolution is the systematic transformation of a society through organization on a mass basis around this collective objective of independence, of liberation, then what does it take to achieve that systematic transformation? First, and most importantly, is political education. It is political education. It is raising the consciousness of the masses so that it's not just one person being like, this is the way. It is every single person in an oppressed nation understanding what needs to happen and why. I already said revolution needs a guiding ideology, an analysis of how the world works and how the people must intervene to change that. Political education is how you disseminate that ideology to the masses of the people. Political education is how you turn that ideology and that theory into a weapon of liberation in their hands. You are not, you are not ever, ever going to have a successful revolution without this component of political education. And that's like the thing that people like to do the least. Like, man, leftists in the United States, like, uh, uh, will like fight you if you say that they should read. <laughs> They'll like fight you if you say we need some theory to guide what we're doing. Um, there is like a, a very like individualist and capitalist mindset which says that people are just like, I know, I already know everything I need to be free. I just need to do it as an individual and that's somehow gonna be successful. Like, that's like a very major mindset within the social justice movement, within the left movement in the United States. And it's because we're in the United States. It's because we are indoctrinated with nothing but like capitalist nonsense, 24 seven, 365, and then we internalize it and then repeat it and say it's social justice. The fact of the matter is that the revolutions that were successful, the revolutions that actually won, all had this component of political education, of mass consciousness raising of developing a guiding ideology 
that explains why the world is the way it is and what we can do collectively to change that world. Without that, like, maybe just think of it as like a plan, right? As like the strategy, as like the blueprint. Without the blueprint, you're not building shit. You're not building shit. Nothing's happening. You must have a plan that everyone understands, not just like the big picture, but also their role in that plan. Otherwise, you are not going to have a successful revolution. Political education around a revolutionary ideology and revolutionary theory is a mandatory component of a successful revolution. I'm so sorry, you are not like your lived experience without any kind of study beyond that is not going to win anything for you, especially not as an individual. So people must know what they're fighting for and why. Political education and a revolutionary theory and ideology is how we develop that knowledge collectively within our people. The next necessary component of a successful revolution is organizing all sectors of the society into that revolution. So we, I said at the beginning, the APRP is a mass political party. A mass political party means that we are trying to organize every single African person around this objective of Pan-Africanism, of one unified socialist Africa. We are trying to organize all of our people across identities, across sectors, around this objective. Because we understand that we, there's like billions of us, right? And so if like 25 of us, 300 of us, we're like revolution now. What the hell are we gonna do to lead billions of people to revolution on our own? It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Like it's a, again, it's like a very um, common fantasy, particularly in the United States and in Western nations, that like a very small handful of people will lead a sleeping, sleeping people to, revel, uh, to liberation. It's just not how it works. The common factor in successful revolutionary struggles is that as many sectors of society are, as possible are organized into the revolution, are recruited into the revolution. That's part of the reason why we in APRP say constantly join an organization, join an organization, join an organization. If you are not in an organization, get your ass into an organization. Because in order to organize all sectors of society, we need people active in people's organizations. Things like labor unions, things like student groups, things like women and queer folks collectives, even things like church groups. Like basically we need organizations made up of the people, run by the people, um, so we can have every single sector of society organized around the shared objective. And we're trying to corral like, oh my God, like 10,000 individuals who all want to do their own thing with no, you know, guiding structure, no guiding blueprint. It's just not a thing that's going to happen. I feel like that's part of the reason why, you know, these spontaneous uprisings are put down so consistently because there isn't any like larger organization guiding that work. It's really just a bunch of people going out on the street with all different kinds of motivations and strategies and ideas for how to do what they're trying to do with no unifying plan. And so all that means is that the police have, have a unifying plan. The state has a unifying plan. And all they got to do is go in there with the superior organization and the superior superior firepower and put that shit down. It keeps happening over and over and over again because these spontaneous rebellions are not organized. People are not in organizations. People are acting as individuals and individuals can be very easily overcome by the superior organization of the state. In order to begin to fight back against the organization of the state, against the organization of the oppressor, it means oppressed people must be organized. All sectors of oppressed society should be organized and political organizations, people organizations are the way that we do that. They are a unit of organization. So once again, mandatory aspect of a successful revolution is organizing all sectors of the oppressed society into the revolution, recruiting them and making them active members of it within these people's, people's formations. Another really important aspect of a successful revolutionary struggle is the building of people's institutions. So these are distinct from organizations and that they are things like schools, like radio networks, like newspapers, like things that we can use to put our analysis into the world, to put our messaging into the world. It's also things like clinics, um, like the Black Panther sickle cell uh, treatment centers are an example of this, or free clinics or medical clinics that are run by the revolutionary movement. Um, things like sites of production for, for things like food and clothing and military and industrial equipment. Because understanding that if we are seeking to overthrow the existing capitalist society, that at some point that capitalist society is going to withdraw its resources. 
And if the withdrawing of that resources kills the revolution, then it was not strong enough in the first place. A key component of all successful revolutionary struggles is this aspect of building people's institution, of building modes of production that the people control, so that when the oppressor withdraws their resources, we have the capacity, we have the infrastructure in place required to make sure that it does not put a dent in our efforts, that we can produce our own clothes, our own food, our own bullets, our own gas. All the things we need to keep a liberated territory functioning independently is the idea behind these people institutions. And also, like, of course, like the propaganda wing of like things like this show, things like Hood Communist, um, things like the Black Hammer, uh, Black Hammer Times. All of these are examples of revolutionary people's institutions that have the objective of propagandizing, have the objective of sharing our message of winning our people to the revolution using our own platforms. So those are just as important as like the food production and the clinics and the, and the, and the other modes of production controlled by the people. So building people's institutions, key component of building a successful revolution. And then lastly, once you have these components of political education on a mass basis around the guiding revolutionary ideology, once you have organized all sectors of society into people's organizations, once you have built those people's institutions, those schools, those clinics, those newspapers, those sites of production, then you have the basis to begin fighting for independent political power through campaigns of positive action, like precisely what happened in Ghana with the strikes, like the work stoppages, like the marches, like direct actions. But then you also have the basis to fight for that independent political power through an armed struggle if necessary. All the things that I just talked about are the necessary foundation for the building of independent political power required to change the society. You need that political education, you need that systematic organization, you need people in organizations, you need those institutions, and then you need to use all that infrastructure to begin to wage a confrontation against the state, against the oppressor class, against the colonizer. That is how you build the basis to do that. And then the tactics you can use, like enlisted strikes, work stoppages, marches, demonstrations, direct actions, teachings, boycotts, strategic participation in elections, assuming you have your own goddamn party, like not that you're voting for the oppressor's party, but you have a people's party that can actually contest for power with an election that you can organize people to support. Like that's, that's, a, that's a valid strategy. And then also, of course, once that infrastructure exists, that is when armed resistance becomes possible. And you can see in all of, you know, these like parameters that I defined, why building a revolution is, would be a long-term process. Because you cannot, for example, educate an oppressed nation, like thousands of people or millions of people in a matter of like a year, in a matter of a few weeks or spontaneously, right? Like that is a systematic long-term project that is required to build a revolution. Same thing with building these people's organizations and getting people active in these organizations. Like that is long-term work. It's long-term work. There's like 10 people in APIP in New Mexico right now and that took two years. It took two years. And I feel like now we have the infrastructure in place to make it like a, a faster process. But understanding that like getting, building revolutionary people's organizations, getting people to become active in these organizations, getting people to understand why revolution is in their best interest and how they can contribute to it is like long-term work long-term work like constant struggle and consciousness raising like on off top like that's why you see why revolutions are happening on like a 10-year timeline a 15-year timeline a 20-year timeline because this is like slow systematic work and obviously the same thing for the building of people's institutions although once you have that political education component once you have people active in organizations the building of institutions becomes much less much less difficult than you would think like when Oregon chapter uh, formed a freedom school called the School of African Roots, we did so after we had already been running a breakfast program for a year. And it took like probably like three, three, to, three to four months for the school to get going because we weren't starting from scratch. Because we already were organized, we already had a shared understanding of our objectives and our ideology, and we understood how the school would play a part in that. And we also had the practical day-to-day -day experience of being active in a revolutionary organization. We knew how to work together. We knew how to build things together. We knew how to like propagandize and spread the word about it. So it was like a much easier process. And so I say all that to say that like even though um, political education and organizing all sectors of society takes like a long time, once you have those pieces, the building of people's inst institutions and the fighting for independent political power becomes a lot easier. It's not easy but it's a lot easier because you have the infrastructure in place required to build it. Well, I feel like y'all are like popping off in the chat, so let me see what you're saying. 
blah, blah, blah. So Eduardo from San Antonio, hi, Karma, is saying he used to work for a horticultural company claiming that the green capitalist mindset nonsense. Yeah, so that's like a reference back to the early conversation I had about, you know, how people say they're vegan um, because they're against animal cruelty, but then they like ignore the cruelty inherent in all parts of the food production system under capitalism, even for vegan food. So correct. And then also like the whole idea of green capitalism where like the solution to um, catastrophic climate change is like electric cars and solar energy and stuff. But like, meanwhile, the resources required to build those solar panels and to manufacture those cars are still being stolen from Africa and Central and South America, places like the Congo, places like Bolivia, places like Argentina, places like Chile. So even though the electric car itself is like ostensibly better for the planet than like the gas, gasoline powered car, the resources required to manufacture the electric car still require violence and exploitation because that is how capitalism works. So green capitalism is like a bunch of, a bunch of BS. A bunch of malarkey. <laughs> I feel like um, Joe Biden should not own the word malarkey because it's a cool word. So, but basically I'm trying to say it's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, there is not, there's, green capitalism is like a, it's just a lie. It's a lie. People are still going to die. People are still going to suffer. The planet's still going to be destroyed. Until capitalism is destroyed, climate change and the destruction of the planet are still going to be an issue. Um, Monica says, I'll pass on Biden and Harris. That's trash. I agree. I would fight Joe Biden or Kamal Harris. Right now. <laughs> Let me not say that. I just don't care for them. And I don't care for people telling me I should vote for them um, as a strategy to liberate my people or to make the conditions of my people better. Because I feel like saying that requires ignoring the entirety of their political backgrounds and the entirety of their political ideology and the entirety of their alignment with this genocidal empire. Those people do not mean us well. Those people, if they are to win office, will be as destructive to the masses of African and oppressed people around the world as President Trump. And I will fight about that. Let's see. Just who gonna, I don't know. I don't know. I thought y'all might appreciate. Oh, sweet, you're tagging people. Thank you, Tori. And then Monika says, organizers we build and we also build toward long-term change. That is precisely what the role of an organizer is. To have an idea of the larger picture of what we are trying to achieve and then working to recruit people to that vision to help build that vision and moving collectively towards it. Organization is not just about what happens on the streets on a Friday. Organization is about building the infrastructure required to create a new world. And that is long-term work for decades. Like the sexy part, like the part with the guns or the part where you're like burning down the White House. <laughs> I need to chill. Or the part where you're like uh, attacking the enemy directly. Um, that's like a very, very small part of the process of revolution. The longer term process of revolution is mostly about organizing the people, building relationships with the people, building institutions, building organizations, building the infrastructure required to make that armed struggle possible, to make it winnable. So yes. And then Tiernan says, I agree, support and try and carry out everything you said. Love hearing you talk, warrior. I love you, Tiernan. I love Tiernan. Tiernan's a comrade from Oregon. Comrade for life. So... So we talked about what is required um, of these, of uh, what is required to win a revolution, to win the systemic transformation of society through organization on a mass basis. You need political education. You need all sectors of the oppressed society organized into people's organizations. You need to build people's institutions. And then you need to use that infrastructure to fight for independent political power independent political power using all strategies and tactics that are applicable to your context. And I just want to say again that that includes strikes, includes work stoppages, includes marches, demonstrations, direct actions, like people shutting down the highway. Imagine, like, remember, like, five years ago when, like, people in Black Lives Matter, including myself, were, like, shutting down the highway, shutting down the airport, shutting down the Mall of America just because we felt like it, just because it was, like, a Tuesday and we were mad. Imagine it if we had done those kinds of actions as part of a larger revolutionary struggle. Imagine if instead of like one time um, Black Lives Matter Portland, we shut down all of the traffic, all of the buses, all the trains, and all of the traffic in downtown Portland for like four hours, two times, two times, and no one got arrested. Imagine if we had done that as part of a revolutionary strategy, right? Like instead of shutting it down for four hours, two times, because we felt like it, we did it for a week, three times, as part of a demand that would build the revolution. 
these strategies that we use, uh, mobiliz strategies of mobilization, strategies of direct action, um, strategies of labor organization, they are all valid, but they are not being used in such a way that it's building toward a larger vision of revolution. It is actually remarkable. Uh, there is a whole generation of African organizers that were radicalized by Mike Brown and Eric Garner um, who engaged in these extremely militant actions you know, that brought commerce, that brought traffic to a grinding halt in major US cities. And that we were doing that with no formal experience, no formal training, just like figuring out as we went, like how to do this safely and effectively. There's like hundreds, maybe thousands of us that have that experience. But we do not have experience applying that as part of a revolutionary strategy. And I'm saying that we have the skills. We just need the larger objective and the larger shared vision for how to get there. But imagine if those tactics were deployed in service of the revolution, what we could accomplish. We already know we can do it. We already know we can do it. It's just a matter of when we are deploying those strategies. Man, I think about this all the time. I don't know if you can tell. Anyway, so yeah. And then the other thing I want to say about, um, you know, strategies of fighting for independent political power. Um, so there's like the nonviolent strategies, of course. I also want to say that like strategic participation in elections is a valid revolutionary strategy. For example, the MAS party in Bolivia recently won um, the election there. Uh, a fascist was put in power by the U.S. working with, you know, Western imperialists. And the people of Bolivia, through the mass organization, pushed that fascist out of power and put mass back in power. But it would be a mistake to look at that situation and be like, oh, that means voting is a valid revolutionary strategy in all, in all situations. No. Because first of all, to even make that election possible, to, to force the fascist government, and it was an openly fascist government that was anti-indigenous and committing like mass acts of brutality and genocide against indigenous people, to force that government to even hold the election, the masses of indigenous and African people and oppressed people in Bolivia had to have strikes and marches and demonstrations on a constant basis. They had to show that government that if they did not hold that election, that the people would be ungovernable. That the people would not allow the state to function. The people in Bolivia were basically like, you either let us vote or we're going to tear this shit down. And so the fascist government was like, damn, okay. And they did it because they knew that the people meant it. So like, and then the other thing about um, the election victory of the Socialist Party in, in Bolivia, the MAS Party, is that they had already engaged <clears throat> in this process of political education and also of organizing all sectors of society into their revolutionary vision, into people's organizations. If they had not done that work, they would never have had the mass movement required to force the fascist government to have the election. They would not have had the base required to have those demonstrations and have them organized enough to be able to resist state violence, to be able to resist the attempts of the fascist government to repress the movement. The reason why the MAS party had that electoral victory is because they went through precisely the steps that we're talking about right now. They engaged in that mass political education. They engaged in that mass organization of all sectors in society. They built independent people's institutions. And most importantly, the MAS party is not a ruling class party. The MAS party is not controlled by the colonizer. The MAS party is controlled by the masses of people in Bolivia. That's their organization that they built. So when people look at Bolivia and be like, see, they voted. That means vote for Biden as a radical strategy. No, no, okay, <laughs> because I'm so mad when people are saying this. Because the Democratic Party is not a people's party. The Democratic Party is run by billionaires and white supremacists and racists. Kwame Ture used to say only in the United States would a houseless person and a billionaire be in the same political organization and believe that they have the same interests. The Democratic Party is that motherfucking organization, is that institution. The Democratic Party has people who are unemployed, homeless, completely lacking all access to resources because of the configuration of the settler state. And it also has people like Warren Buffett and George Soros and these billionaires in the same organization saying, I, I need the same things you do, homeless person. Who do you think controls the Democratic Party? Is the person who cannot find a consistent place to sleep because of capitalism? Or is the person who is making billions of dollars because of the way the capitalist system functions? Who in that party, and they're in the same party, 
has the power in that situation. If you say the houseless person, you are very idealistic. The fact of the matter is that both the Democratic and Republican parties are controlled by the interests of the ruling class in the United States. They only differ in the aesthetic approach, but they are fundamentally about making sure that rich people stay rich and everybody else stays poor and oppressed. And that means that the Democratic Party, while it is under the control of these billionaires, of the ruling class, can never, ever be a vehicle for revolutionary change. It only ever exists to co-opt and manipulate and redirect radical people's movements. Like that is why the Democratic Party exists. And so people saying that voting for the Democratic Party is any kind of radical strategy are misled or just point blank lying to you because it's just not going to work. That is not a people's organization. That is not a political party that is accountable to any kind of people's movement. It was not even built with a people's movement. It was built by rich people. It's been controlled by rich people from the very beginning. So do not tell me, don't ever compare what happened to Bolivia to this raggedy election. Do not say that voting for a ruling class party, a bourgeois controlled party, could ever be an effective revolutionary strategy. It's just not. We must build independent political organizations controlled by the masses of oppressed people, controlled by the masses of African people. African people need our own independent political parties. That is what the APRP is. That is what Ujima People's, People's Progress Party is. That is what the Republic of New Africa is, MXGM. They are independent African people's organizations. Black Hammer is an independent, colonized people's organization. Understand, we are not trying to take control of a ruling class party. We are trying to build our own political party, just like Mas in Bolivia, because that is the only way, the only way that participating in an election makes any sense is if you are voting for someone who is accountable to the mother, excuse me, who is accountable to the masses of people. When I get worked up, it's very hard, like the swears start flying. So yes, I just wanted to have that little tangent um, because some people try to try to say that, you know, strategic, so-called strategic participation in elections controlled by the ruling class can somehow be a revolutionary strategy. It never has been, y'all. It never has been, and it never will be. Anywho. So now, um, lastly, I want to end with um, just like a brief discussion about guerrilla warfare and uh, strategies of armed struggle that are effective in a revolutionary movement to end oppression. So guerrilla warfare is a really key concept to understand because it's basically how people who are drastically outgunned and drastically outnumbered are still able to wage um, armed struggle and be successful. So it's how, like, for example, the Haitian Revolution was able to beat the French Empire and then the British Empire and then the Spanish. It was how my ancestors in Honduras, the Garifuna people, were able to kick on the British Empire and resist enslavement. It is also how the Cuban Revolution, first the Cuban Independence Movement and then the Cuban Revolution were able to beat the Spanish and then the U.S. Empire. And also how the U.S. Empire is still has still not been able to recolonize Cuba. It's how they won in Vietnam. It's how they won in Mozambique. It's how they won in Angola. And it's a very, very, very common means of engaging in armed struggle, particularly when it is a much smaller force against an empire. Superior organization will always beat superior numbers and firepower. I'm gonna say it again. Superior organization will always beat superior numbers and firepower. Oftentimes when people with revolutionary politics talk about the possibility of revolution in the United States, there's like a person from the back who's like, you couldn't possibly fight the US empire and win. They have drones, they have guns, Woo! like all kinds, like just very, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to like imitate like the fear, right? Because there's always like that person who's like, it's just not possible. We have to work within the system because we just can't win. But if that were actually the case, uh, the Haitian revolution would not have been successful. The uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese War of National Liberation would not have been successful. They were fighting France and the United States at the same time. Uh, the struggle against apartheid would not have been successful. The struggle, the Cuban Revolution would not have been successful. The decisive factor is always the amount of firepower and the numbers and the relative power of the, of the people involved. If the stronger entity always wins, then no National Liberation struggle ever 
would have been successful. Because in every single case, it was colonized nations that had been systematically underdeveloped, that had been kept impoverished and poor and colonized, that were able to organize collectively to defeat empires. You know the U.S. empire has not won a war decisively in like over 50 years? It has not won a war outright in over 50 years. Not since before the Vietnam War has the U.S. empire decisively won any war it initiated. It didn't happen in Afghanistan. Didn't happen in Iraq. Didn't even happen in Libya. The best that they have been able to do post-Vietnam War is just create a bunch of chaos that they scramble to, uh, they scramble to exploit, right? But in terms of just like decisively winning a war, like for example, against the Taliban in Afghanistan, they have not been able to do so in over 50 years. You are telling me this empire is invincible and they can't even fight, win a war that they started against like a handful of, of Afghanistan and man, Afghani men in like the mountains? <laughs> like the Taliban forced the US empire to negotiate because they fought so effectively against the US forces in Afghanistan that the US had no choice. They had no choice. They could not win. They could not win against those people that they had drastically outnumbered and now gunned. So what I'm trying to say is that the idea that um, an enemy is too big for anyone to face, the idea that all of these empires are too strong um, to be confronted is a lie propagated by the enemy. Because in time after time after time after time, from the Haitian Revolution onwards, oppressed and colonized people have been able to take out empires, have, uh, have been able to face them in direct confrontations and be successful thanks to superior organization. It doesn't matter if they have bigger guns. It doesn't matter if they appear to be stronger. All that matters is our level of organization and our level of commitment to liberation. That is the deciding factor. That is the deciding factor. That is why guerrilla warfare has been a consistent strategy because the, it's the embodiment of this idea a superior organization beats superior numbers and firepower. That the people who are being invaded, that the people who are being attacked, understand the land, understand the people who live on that land, understand how to work with the territory to engage in their struggle, they will be able to beat an invading force. It's happened in place after place after place after place. And so this could be like a whole show unto itself, right? To talk about like this, the different military strategies that have been successful in revolutionary struggles of oppressed peoples. But the very, like the, the overall principle of all of it, the guiding principle that defines armed struggle in a revolutionary context for colonized people is that superior organization will always beat superior numbers and firepower. It always will. It doesn't matter if they have bigger guns, if we have the better plan. So yes, guerrilla warfare, brief segue. What are y'all saying? <laughs> um, Bird says, yes. Monica says, facts. Lady Jammer says, hashtag passion. I appreciate y'all. <laughs> um, let me see. Hope says, fuck the colonizers, government, and structures. I agree. I feel like whenever African people are like, the, the purpose of our struggle is to, to, to give the soul or like something, something like, like heal the United States or like give the United States a soul. I'm like, that's not the objective of my liberation struggle. My liberation struggle is to like burn it to the ground and like salt the earth and build something better in its place. Because this entire system, this like colonizer infrastructure, this colonizer nation was built from the ground up to be like exploitative and racist and genocidal and patriarchal and messed up. So like there's nothing about it in my eyes that can be saved. There's nothing about it that I would want to save. There's no part of it that I would like to see carry forward into a new world. So like my African liberation struggle is about liberating Africa and building the world African people want to see. Not a single part of it is about, you know, rehabilitating colonizer structures. Let's see, it's not the people's government. We have to get rid of it. We can't align ourselves with the colonizer. We have to build and organize the masses to create our own systems that actually work for us. A hundred percent, Red Nation gets it. Uh, fuck the US empire and imperialism too, I agree. Um, Sock Puppet Ski says, these weekly shows are the shit comrade you snap every time. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> okay, and then Hope says, land back, water back, relatives in prison back. Yes, free all political prisoners. We need to take it all back. 
Hell yeah. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate your comments. I appreciate y'all asking. So to wrap up this political education segment, which has gone on for a very long time, I got to in the moment. It's my favorite subject. I just want to talk about a couple of examples of successful revolutionary struggles that we as oppressed people, we as African people fighting for our liberation should look to, to say that we don't actually need the, like Black Panther, for example, <laughs> um, the movie, to sit, to see an example of us winning, right? Like in the history of African people's fight to be free, there are many, many, many examples of successful struggles that we built with our own hands, right? Like we have heroes outside of the narrative of Hollywood. We have, we've accomplished like remarkable things just in the fight to be free. We don't need like fictionalized stories that are trying to sell us one particular perspective of the world. Like sometimes people are like, what do you do to escape? Like, how do you like, how do you like um, dream? And like, what do you think about when you dream? And like, how do like, what is your escapism? And like the thing I do when I need that, the thing I do when I want to like feel better about the world is I look at what my people have actually accomplished. And I don't mean that in like the, in like the capitalist sense or the assimilationist sense. I mean in the sense of like, what have we been able to accomplish when we have decided that we are going to live for ourselves, period. That we are not going to try to fit within the system, but that instead we are going to fight against the system and build something better for ourselves. When I look at the examples in the history of African people, of my people doing that, like that is what I dream about. I want to be as badass as like the members of the PIGC as the Africans that fought in the Cuban Revolution, as the Africans who are on the front line in the struggle against apartheid in Southern Africa. Like, those are my heroes. Like, those are my, like, uh, what's that guy's name? T'Challa's a Black Panther. Like, that is who I think about when I dream. I want to live up to be, like, a fraction of that example, right? So, say all that to say that, like, we as African people should be proud. Like I said at the beginning of the show, like, I would not be here if not for the work of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of African people that fought, came before me and fought to be free, that fought for me to be here. And just looking into those stories, looking at that history is like all the dreams that I need. I just want to be able to do something like that. You know what I'm saying? So without further ado, examples of successful revolutionary struggles that we as colonized and oppressed people, we as African people should learn from. First and foremost is the revolution in Guinea-Bissau waged by the PAIGC that successfully defeated Portuguese colonialism. They chased the Portuguese out of Guinea-Bissau and ultimately out of Africa. And not only did they chase the Portuguese out of Africa, but they overthrew a fascist government in Portugal. The revolution in Guinea-Bissau led directly to the end of a fascist dictatorship in Portugal. You are welcome, Portugal. But how did they do that? So the PIGC was not a vanguard party. The PIGC, just like the APRP is a mass pan-African political party, meaning that they worked to organize every single sector of the masses of African people in Guinea-Bissau. They worked to win them to the revolution, to make them active parts of the revolution. And it wasn't just like able-bodied men. It was women. It was youth. It was non-men. It was elders. They worked to organize every single sector. It was peasants. Every single sector of the masses of African people in Guinea-Bissau around this objective of their total independence from the Portuguese. And that was long-term work. This took decades. And Michael Cabral was one of the founders of the PIGC. He was also one of the members of the very first work-study circle of the APRP. And the PIGC itself still exists and is part of the APRP. One day we gotta do a show about the structure of the APRP because y'all don't even realize what a big deal we are. It's fine. But, um, but yeah, so the PIGC is part of the APRP. And like right now as we speak, there are members of the APRP who are in like the, the PIGC holds state power in Guinea-Bissau still. And there are members of the APRP in the government, in PIGC, in the PIGC in Guinea-Bissau. Like this, this comrade Imani, uh, who grew up in St. Louis, he was born and raised here, and now he's in Africa. A member of the PIGC and the APRP building the revolution, because that's what we do. So yeah, the PIGC worked to organize all sectors of African society around this objective of revolution. Um, worked to recruit them into the revolution, worked to make them active parts of the revolution. It had a special focus on the emancipation of women and children, right? Because the colonial structure, the colonial society the Portuguese had built was extremely, like it was oppressive for everybody. African people were basically like living like slaves on their own land. But it was also extremely patriarchal in that they made the African people slaves 
And then they made African women and children and non-men the slaves of the slaves. So African children and women and non-men were like not allowed to read, were not allowed to have like basic rights in the Portuguese society that had been built on African land in Guinea-Bissau. And so part of the work of recruiting the people into the revolution, of engaging in this act of mass organization and acts of mass political education was to break down the, the uh, fighting to, was to break down the systematic oppression of the women and non-men and children that had been created by the Portuguese, was to, to teach the masses of African people in Guinea-Bissau that we cannot build a new world where men are on the top and women are on the bottom. It's just not gonna work. In order for the revolution to be successful, women and men and non-men have to fight side by side as equals. That means that you as a man might report to a woman it means that you as a woman are going to be expected to take up the armed struggle or to be on the front lines or to be engaged in actively in this revolutionary process. And it also meant, like when you say that women are going to have to be fighting side by side, when you say that women and non-men are going to have to be active agents of the revolution, that means that you must prepare the children. You must prepare for childcare. You must make it accessible for mothers to participate in the revolution. We talked about Tatina Sila. At the beginning of the show, a young African woman in Guinea-Bissau who was a mother, I believe she was 24 years old, she had a child, and she was still a general in the war. She was still on the front line engaging this revolutionary struggle. And the way that that was possible is because the PIGC organized schools and childcare and means, and then also recruited the men into childcare themselves so that the woman could be on the front line, the woman could be active on the battlefield and the men would be at home watching the children. And this was counter to everything the Portuguese had built. And that was a part of building for the revolution. A really, really good book um, to check out about how the PIGC was able to do this work in Guinea-Bissau is Fighting Two Colonialisms by Stephanie Ordang. We read it in work study in the APRP. And it's basically a book about how as the masses of African people in Guinea-Bissau were engaged in this collective fight against the Portuguese, there was also this internal struggle that they had to wage against patriarchy and against the oppression of women and children um, within the African people in Guinea-Bissau. And so that book is about how they did that at the same time, at the same time, at the same time. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes dudes um, in the revolution will be like, okay, so we understand that women are oppressed, or we understand queer people are oppressed, or we understand X, Y, Z, but we can't deal with that right now. We have to focus on the liberation on the basis of being African. And what the example of the PIG shows is that you don't actually have to do that. And also, if you don't do that, if instead you say, we're going to make sure everybody gets free at the same time, regardless of gender, regardless of identity, regardless of ability, regardless of age, that you will be successful. If you wage that internal struggle against patriarchy, against ableism, against against all these isms created by capitalism, at the same time as you're waging the external struggle against the system, you will win. You will win because all of the people that are oppressed by the isms will be 100% committed to the revolution you are building because we understand clearly that it will liberate us, that we will not be building a new world where cishet dudes um, are the only people with rights and everybody else has us to fight. No, we are building from the ground up a new world in which everybody, everybody plays an active part, plays an active leadership role. So whenever you hear someone say that we have to focus on this right now and all these other isms are for later, that person does not understand how revolution actually works. Because the revolutions that won dealt with it all at the same time, like the one in guinea Bissau. Another example of, oh yeah, so yeah, I talked about, yeah, I already talked about how the, the revolution in Guinea-Bissau, like it chased the Portuguese out of um, Africa, but it also ended a fascist government in Portugal because Portugal, of course, was like only, it was only like a, a world power because of the resources that it stole from Africa. Like Portugal is like kind of like a second tier European country um, in that it, it's on its own, it has like no power. It's only like propped up the other ones. And so it used the resources of these African countries that it colonized to build itself up into a world power. And then once the African people took that shit back, once they were like, no, thank you, you can get out of here. The fascist government that was in power in Portugal was significantly weakened. And the masses of people in Portugal had already been on the street, like fighting for it to be overthrown because it's a fascist government. And so once it was weakened, that was their opportunity to overthrow it completely. So it is not an exaggeration to say that without the national liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau, 
um, Portugal's fascist dictatorship would not have fallen. It was the combined resistance of my people in Guinea-Bissau, of African people, combined with the masses of poor and working class people in Portugal um, working to overthrow this government that led to the end of that fascist dictatorship. So once again, you're welcome, Portugal. Um, another example of a successful revolution is, of course, the Cuban Revolution. Wait, let me see, let me see. Um, yes, Bird, I'd be really interested to, talk about your, to hear you talk about your structure. I agree. We want to have shows where um, we have guest speakers. Like we've been talking about doing this series of 101 topics, like covering like what is solidarity, what is socialism, what is neocolonialism, what is revolutionary organization. And so we want to have folks come in from the APRP and other member organizations of the APRP to talk about that. And so hopefully we can go into that soon. Um, Ghetto Intellectual is saying non-man. So some people identify as men, some people identify as women, and some people identify as neither. And so when I say non-men, that's who I mean. Non-binary people exist. Bird, heart, emo heart eye emojis. I love Bird. I feel like Bird is like the most consistent comment. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bird and Sock, Papatsky, and Monika. Thank you, Bird. So, okay, so example of the Cuban Revolution. So the Cuban Revolution, they had first a war of independence where they successfully chased out Spain. They overthrew Spanish colonialism. And then after Spain got chased out, the United States like sniffed around and got their hooks in Cuba too. And so Cuba had to wage a second, a second revolutionary struggle in order to overthrow U.S. imperialism and build a socialist state. And that, that right there is the reason why the United States hates Cuba. Because one thing to understand about Cuba is that Cuba is a majority African nation. Like you go to Cuba and you see almost all African people or people who are clearly of some African descent or some indigenous descent. And so the United States is like ideologically against socialism because the United States whole existence depends on the capitalist uh, a uh, way of organizing society in which they can exploit people and exploit resources and just like take, 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 take. And socialism says that like, you can't do that because we own it collectively. So the United States hates socialism for that reason. But also the United States hates Cuba because Cuba is a non-white country that defied the United States. And Cuba is like a hundred miles off the coast of the United States, just chilling, like free. And the United States like can't take it. Like can't take it. They're so mad. Like they're so mad because the United States is a white supremacist settler colonial empire built with this whole idea that European people on the basis of being white are somehow better than all of us and fit to rule all of us. And so Cuba, this like small little island of Cuba that is mostly African indigenous said, actually, no, thank you. We're going to be free. And then they like maintain that for over 60 years, just off the coast of the United States. It's like this white supremacist superpower talking about white is right, talking about capitalism the only way. Talk about the end of history. And then here's Cuba, brown as hell, socialist, defying the United States. Like, that's part of the reason why. There's, like, the ideological commitment to capitalism, the material and economic commitment to capitalism. But there's also the fact that it's just a bunch of African and indigenous people, like, defy the United States, beat the United States, and have continued to defy the United States for over 60 years. Like, that is part of the reason why the United States has a huge bug up its ass about Cuba. That right there, because Cuba defied them. Cuba won against them, and Cuba keeps beating them. Cuba keeps winning. Someone, we had a panel yesterday where a comrade was saying the United States tried to kill Fidel Castro like over 600 times, and he still died peacefully in his bed of old age, surrounded by people who loved him. They tried to kill him over 600 times, and he still died of natural causes. Peacefully! And he's probably in heaven right now, like the littest section. But yeah, so the United States has a bug of its ass about Cuba because what Cuba represents, right? And Cuba not only fought two successful revolutions, and even before the, the two successful revolutions, there was like continuous resistance of African indigenous people against colonizations that created the ground for those, for those revolutions to be possible. But, um, so Cuba not only did that, one, but Cuba has also engaged in a collective process of building a new form of society that every single sector of Cuban society is a part of. So they fought that armed struggle, but the revolution is still happening. It's still continuing. The armed struggle that they won through guerrilla warfare and that mass political, uh, that mass organization um, is, was one particular phase. But the revolution in Cuba is still happening right now. And now they're in the long-term phase of building this socialist society, of having all sectors of society, of Cuban society that have been organized, moving collectively to build this new social society and moving it towards communism. It is an ongoing process. 
And so the example of the Cuban Revolution is extremely important because it shows us a couple of things. One, again, it shows us that superior organization will always beat superior firepower. Always, always, always. And not only that, but superior organization enables it so that we can defend what we win. Because after the armed struggle phase of the Cuban Revolution, the U.S. Empire did not stop attacking them on that basis. They have been engaged in terrorist attacks on Cuba constantly. There's the blockade, which is an economic attack, an economic strategy of genocide. But there's also like a chemical warfare, right? Like they introduced intentionally, the United States government introduced intentionally dengue fever to Cuba in the 80s. And it killed 100 kids, children, before Cuba realized what was happening, was able to synthesize a vaccine and stop the spread. The United States introduced a, a virus that killed all the citrus trees in Cuba. So now that shit will still like straight up not grow. It can't grow oranges, it can't grow lemons, can't grow any citrus products in Cuba because the United States intentionally introduced a virus to kill off the, all the plants. The United States funds far right forces in Cuba to engage in terrorist attacks. There's actually a really good movie on Netflix. I was kind of shocked it was on there, but it's called the Wasp, the Wasp Network. And it's a true story about how the U.S. government hired and funded terrorists to engage in bombing campaigns in Cuba to attack the Cuban Revolution. There is a scene in that movie where they, the man they hired, that they gave money to, blows up a hotel in Havana. That actually happened. And that was not the only time. It happened hundreds of times. The United States is not just blockading Cuba economically. The United States has been engaged in warfare acts of war against Cuba on a consistent basis that have killed thousands of Cuban people. So I say all that to say that not only in the case of Cuba did superior organization beat superior numbers and firepower in the phase of the armed struggle, but it is successfully defending that revolution from repeated attacks to this day. To this day! The only reason that Cuba has been able, able to survive this blockade, which is meant to strangle them, to strangle them completely, to kill them off. The only reason they've been able to survive is because they are organized enough to make use of the resources they have. They are organized enough to use their collective brilliance to make sure that even if the U.S. says, you're not going to get gas, like Venezuela is trying to send you oil, we're going to take the ships, so you can't get any oil, so you can't turn your lights on, they still figure out how to live. They still figure out how to feed each other. They still figure out how to produce because that is why they are organized around their liberation they're committed to being free and so even though the u.s empire has all of these resources to throw at attacking the cuban revolution they have to this day not been successful because the cuban revolution and the cuban people the cuban people want to be free and the cuban people are organized to defend their revolution and to keep it going no matter what the u.s does and so the cuban revolution the example of the cuban revolution is extremely important because it shows one that a better world can be built even in the shadows of the old one even with the old one constantly attacking you we can still do this and it also shows that revolution is not just about the part where we pick up the guns revolution is about organizing every single aspect of a society around the objective of being free and not just fighting for that for a moment but fighting for that for life fighting to build something new for life as part of a long-term process encompassing an entire nation. Sometimes people in the United States are like, man, revolution sounds, you know, hard. People are going to die. People are going to, um, you know, take on extraordinary risk. You know, folks, they're going to attack us. They're going to make it hard to live. Like, is it worth it? Is revolution worth it? And what Guinea-Bissau shows us, what Cuba shows us, is that it is. That not only can we fight for something different, that we can fight for something better, but that we can build that collectively and we can defend it. Once we decide to be free and once we are organized to fight for that freedom, there is nothing anyone can do to dissuade us or defeat us. It is superior organization that is the deciding factor. And superior organization is what makes revolution worth it. Because we do not have to accept this particular form of society where people have to be exploited and oppressed and abused in order to give wealth to a handful of people. We don't have to accept that. We can build something way better in its place. And it not only is it possible, but it's preferable. I went to Cuba 
And when I got back, I was like, I'm not ever going to hear any single argument against revolution ever again for the rest of my life. Because I saw plainly, with my own eyes, how much better on every single basis Cuban society is to American society. I went there in this body, tall, dark-skinned African woman who gets like all kinds of, all kinds of people are giving me all kinds of shit on a constant basis just because of the way I look, just because of the shit they've internalized about African people and about women. In Cuba, I felt none of that. I'm not saying it's not racist because Africa is not free, so people are still going to be racist. But what I am saying is that I was free to exist in my own skin in a way that I've never experienced in any other place. And what I also saw was African people who understood themselves as part of this new, better, revolutionary society who could very clearly understand how they contributed to building this new, better thing, who looked at us like Africans from the U.S. and were like, damn, like y'all need to, good luck to you. Like they were like, get it together. Like they were like, come join us. I remember we had, we were, uh, we saw like a panel discussion of um, uh, veterans of the Cuban Revolution. And one of the veterans was an African man named Victor Drakey. Victor Drakey, um, some of y'all might know his name right away, but he's like really, really famous in the revolutionary left. He was an active member of the Cuban Revolution and a leader in that revolution. But he was also one of the leading figures in Cuba's solidarity missions um, to aid anti-colonial struggles in Africa. So he was in the Congo, he was in Mozambique, he was in Angola, he was in Tanzania. He was an active part in the international solidarity missions uh, that Cuba sent to Africa to, to assist our anti-colonial um, liberation movements. And so I remember he was on this panel of um, veterans. And we had a comrade on the brigade, the, v, the Vincent Amos Brigade, who asked, like, you know, she had been engaged in armed struggle. In another context, I think in Colombia. And she was like, I have very bad dreams about what I had to do. I have trouble sleeping. My life is very hard. I don't know how to deal with this trauma. And so she asked them like, how do y'all sleep? Like you've seen so much warfare, you've seen so much battle in Africa and Cuba, like does it weigh on your spirit? I will never forget what this man said. So Victor Drakey was like, no, like I sleep fine. He said that the wars that I fought were for liberation and justice. I fought for the freedom of my people in Cuba. And then we went around the world and helped spot side by side for people in Africa and people throughout the world, the colonized world, to be free as well. And so when I go to sleep, I dream about that. I sleep fine. He was a veteran of all of this war, all of these battles, and all of this violence. But he didn't hold trauma from that. He held pride. Because he understood that he had been fighting the whole time for the collective liberation of humanity and of life on Earth. He felt nothing but peace about it. Like, ask a veteran of the United States military how they sleep if they've been deployed to, like, Iraq or Afghanistan or someplace in Africa. Ask them how they feel about that shit. It will not be the same answer. And so revolution ultimately is about the belief that we can radically transform society if we work together. That we do not have to accept the way things are, a society built on exploitation. That we have the capacity to build a new way of living that is centered on life, that is just for all of us. And that we can not only build that, but defend it. And that no matter what mistakes we make on the way, no matter what missteps we make in building it, no matter what errors we have to correct, it will always be better than what we are dealing with right now. That is why I'm a revolutionary, because I understand very fully the risk it means to say that we must engage in a revolutionary struggle to be free. And to me, that risk is worth it. Because I refuse to accept this capitalist system, this colonizer system, this imperialist system built on the back of my ancestors, built by exploiting my land. Like, I don't accept that. I know that we can do better. And I believe with all of my heart that if we work collectively, we would build something better. What are y'all saying? So Hope is saying, yep, there is consistent instances in history where the U.S. engaged in acts of warfare in Cuba and outside of the U.S., but also inside of the U.S. They sent Tiger Swan and other military police structures to oppress, commit acts of violence and genocide to Native nations too. We need to be as organized as Cuba and Palestine to build our masses. Correct. Correct. So like those, the same terrorist attacks that I discussed the Cuban or the US empire using against the Cuban revolution in Cuba, they have absolutely done the same thing to oppress and colonize people resisting the empire here. 
that's actually to me a very clear indication of why we cannot work within the system because they will kill us as soon as they have the chance but yeah hope is absolutely right like you know the obama administration deployed mercenaries and paramilitary forces and militarized police and national guard to standing rock when indigenous nations were just saying we need water to live do not destroy this source of water because everybody on this planet needs water to live and in response the obama administration was like here have these tanks and drones and surveillance and mercenaries obama with vice president biden and also, of course, like for the African liberation movement, we have seen our revolutionaries murdered, incarcerated. We have seen entire neighborhoods bombed from the sky, like what happened with MOVE. We have seen our organizations infiltrated and destroyed, all, all for the so-called crime of fighting for the liberation of our people. So absolutely the same terroristic tactics that the U.S. empire has used to attack the revolution in Cuba, and not just in Cuba, but throughout the global south and throughout Africa, they have absolutely used against us. U.S. government killed MLK. U.S. government killed Malcolm X. U.S. government helped kill Patrice Lumumba. U.S. government helped kill Che Guevara. Like, they kill revolutionaries, not just in the global south, but right here on this land. And then y'all will tell me I should vote for Joe Biden as a strategy to liberate African people when this system will openly murder my heroes for fighting to be free. You tell me I have to work within this system? Within this system where Mumia is still locked up? Where Clifton White here in TR territory is locked up for organizing a Black Lives Matter march? Where Asaya Shakur is trapped in Cuba? Which, I mean, I would like to be trapped in Cuba. But if she's in Cuba because she was persecuted by the U.S. government for fighting for the liberation of our people, you tell me I should vote? I should vote? I should work within that system? That's what you're telling me? Not even with my own party, but with, like, their party? You are out of your mind. I'm sorry. I'm good on that. Anyway. So those are just some examples of successful revolutions. Just to wrap up this conversation, uh, why African people need revolution? So why is the All African People's Revolutionary Party a revolutionary Pan-African Socialist Party? Why do we believe revolution is the means that African people will use to liberate ourselves? And that is because what I said at the very beginning of the show, no oppressor, no colonizer, no bourgeois member of the ruling class will ever willingly give up what they have. They will never, ever, ever, ever willingly destroy the exploitative relationship that they have built with us. The entirety of this global economic system of capitalism rests on a foundation built by exploiting Africa. Capitalism could not function globally without the exploitation of Africa and African people, period. It could not function without the resources in the land and the labor stolen from Africa. So understanding that, you must understand that there is not a chance on earth that this system will willingly give up what it needs to survive in order to liberate us. It will kill us. It will burn the earth to the ground. It will fall all the water before it gives up what it needs to survive. So understanding that, the only way that African people are gonna see liberation, the only way that African people are gonna see self-determination is if we collectively fight as African people around this political objective of Pan-Africanism, of liberating our home and our land, of taking it from capitalism's claws and giving it to the collective control of our people. That's it. Capitalism will not give that back on its own. We must take it. And the way that we take it is by organizing a mass revolutionary movement, a struggle of African people all around the world around the shared objective of liberating our home, of liberating Africa, period. The oppressor will not give us our liberation. We will not be able to vote away the foundation of the capitalist system of being our exploitation. There's no way out through this system. No way. It doesn't matter how many billionaires, African billionaires there are. It doesn't matter how many fucking, excuse my language. It doesn't matter how many neocolonial leaders give away chunks of our land to African billionaires like Kanye West was just given an island in Haiti by the neocolonial president of Haiti. They just gave him the island. And now they're like killing off African people who live around it so they can make way for development. That's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. But what I'm saying is African billionaires will not save us. African representation within the capital system will not save us. African leadership of these empires will not save us. 
The only thing that is going to save Africa and African people, the only thing, quite frankly, that's going to save life on Earth is a revolution to destroy the capitalist system and liberate Africa, period, point blank. They're not going to give us our freedom. We must take it. And revolution is how we take it. Let me see. So that was like the PE portion. That was like two hours. So I'm going to wrap it up because I'm mad tired. I'm tired. But I did briefly mention. So uh, Haiti has been in a state of continuous uprising. Uh, for over a year at this point, for almost like two, three years, Haiti, Haitians have been in the streets constantly calling for justice, calling for the end of the dictator in power in that nation. And the reason why that dictator is in power in that nation is because uh, in 2009, the democratically elected, he was like a social democrat, the democratically elected social democratic president of Haiti was overthrown by U.S. government-backed paramilitary forces and in his place, they put this motherfucking puppet. And now this puppet, who is backed by the United States, who uses U.S. armed and funded police to attack African people in Haiti, is giving away pieces of the island to billionaires. Kanye West was literally just given an island in Haiti by this neocolonial dictator that was put in power and remains in power thanks to the U.S. government. God, it makes me so mad. Like, I used to, like, when Kanye started running for president, I was kind of like, that's funny. <laughs> and maybe this is, like, my, like, the retribution, right, for, for me thinking that was funny. But, like, I remember when, like, Kanye pops off, and he wore, like, the manga hat, and he was, like, all mad. I was like, I don't really understand how, like, Kanye's politics, for example, are, like, distinct from, like, Jay-Z's politics, right? Because Jay-Z is all for the Democratic Party. But neither the Democrats or the Republicans are going to be good for African people. So why is it that Kanye gets like all this extra hate because he went to the red side? Meanwhile, Jay-Z's kissing the ring on the blue side. And that's supposed to be different? How is that different? Both the Democrat and Republican Party mean African people harm. The Democratic, it happened under a Democratic president. The U.S. military footprint in Africa was drastically expanded under the last Democratic U.S. president. That was Barack Obama with Vice President Joe Biden. So why should I, as an African person, somehow have more understanding for this billionaire kiss in the blue ring versus this billionaire kiss in the fucking red ring? I don't. I just don't. To me, Jay-Z and Kanye are the same. Jay-Z just has a bitter, better filter. And they're both sellouts and they are both full of shit. And now Kanye is taking like, new colonial governments are just like giving them chunks of African land. And he's like taking that shit and trying to tell us, it's for us collectively, he's like, I'm going to build, you know, industries and develop that island. It's going to be for the collective advancement of the African people. Meanwhile, the African people that live on that island are going to motherfucking massacred by the police. For him. Oh my god, colonizers come with many skin colors. Colonizers come with many different uh, levels of power. Kanye West is a motherfucking colonizer. I don't give a fuck. Anyway. So I just wanted to briefly mention that. I think that people should look that up. Because, like, his... Uh, you know, overtures to the Trump administration are far from the worst shit he has done. Uh, people should really look into the investments of Kanye West and other members of the African petty bourgeois and bourgeois to see how much they are monetizing the exploitation and colonization of their own people. And maybe when we get some clarity about how these people are moving, we will stop looking to them for political leadership within our movements. Not P. Diddy, not T.I., not Killer Mike, not Kanye West, not Dave Chappelle, not a single one of these rich African sellouts is fit to lead a struggle for our liberation. Only the masses of poor and red class African people are going to lead the struggle for pan-Africanism. You all need to, need to sign some checks or get the fuck out of the way. I swear to God. Anyway, my name is Onya Sanmu. This is weekly pan-African news presented by the All African People's Revolutionary Party in New Mexico. We do this every single Thursday. Usually we do it at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. I believe going forward, we're going to be moving it to 12 p.m. Mountain Time because I have to work. <laughs> it's the middle of the work day for all of us. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Next week on the show, we're going to be going in deep with another revolutionary concept. Next time we'll be talking about what is socialism. We are revolutionary pan-African socialists. What does that even mean? Like, I feel like I talked about Pan-Africanism super in depth. And so hopefully y'all are beginning to pick up what it is, One Unified Socialist Africa. But what is socialism? And why do we believe socialism is the mechanism for the liberation of Africa and African people? We're going to get into it next Thursday on the show. 
I want to say free Clifton White. Clifton White is a political prisoner who was targeted by the state of New Mexico, the democratic controlled state of New Mexico for persecution for the crime of organizing a Black Lives Matter march and fighting for his community. He is currently locked up and there is a global campaign demanding his liberation. That is hashtag free Clifton White. Look it up. We want to say free all political prisoners, all political prisoners. There are hundreds of people who are now elders still locked up by the U.S. empire and their only crime, I put crime in quotes because it wasn't a crime, the only thing they did was fight for the liberation of their people. That is why they are locked up because they are too dangerous to the interests of the empire and they must be controlled. So free Clifton White, free Mumia, free all political prisoners, period. They are still part of the movement. We will not leave them on the battlefield. We want to say land back from Africa to Turtle Island to Palestine. Land back. That is not a metaphor. We are serious. We are taking back the land. Land was taken. Land will be returned. Land back. We want to say Africa will be free. And it will be pan-Africanism that liberates Africa and the African continent and African people. And thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you will tune in next week. Stay ready for revolution so you don't have to get ready. And have a great day.